Okay, we are going to get started today, and it is uh, thrilling to have um, another series in our webinar um, program here with you today. We have done a few of these and have found them to be really helpful, and we hope today is, is nothing different. Um, but before we begin, we're going to give you the um, proverbial um, watch what we're doing here because we are recording this session in full and we will post the digital recording to the Maryland Smith, Smith website later this week, but please know that we are recording and so if you'd like to drop for that reason, please do so now. Thank you for joining Maryland Smith's webinar series titled What COVID-19 Means for Business and Economics. Today, Smith's very own Dr. P.K. Kanan will discuss marketing during the pandemic, strategies and insights. We are pleased to host you today. I am Christine Thompson. I lead our executive education team at the Smith School, and we are working in partnership with Smith's Office of Alumni Relations to power this fantastic series. We would especially like to welcome our Smith and University of Maryland alumni and current students who have joined us today from across the world. We hope this finds you well and appreciate your time and engagement today. Now I get to introduce uh, Dr. Kanan, and this is a brief introduction to the um, many, many um, accomplishments that he has achieved in his career. So forgive me for the brevity, but this is his show, not, not mine. PK is the Dean's Chair in Marketing Science at the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. His research expertise is on marketing modeling, applying statistical, econometric, machine learning, and AI methods to marketing data. His current research stream focuses on digital marketing, mobile marketing, attribution modeling, media mix modeling, new product service development, and customer relationship management. Dr. Kanan is the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Research in Marketing. He is an associate editor for Journal of Marketing Research and serves on the editorial boards of Marketing Science, the Journal of Marketing, and the Journal of Service Research. Dr. Kanan has served as a chair for the American Marketing Association SIG on marketing research and has chaired the INFORMS service science section uh, many times. And without um, saying he has received many, many accomplishments too long to list here for his teaching um, accolades at the Smith School of Business. So we can't thank him enough for joining us today. One quick um, housekeeping note, we wanna make sure you're keeping your microphones um, muted, but that you know that you have the chat function and the Q&A function both to, su um, to submit your questions. We are going to accept questions throughout the um, presentation and we will take a few breaks to address those questions together. Um, one other note, we are gonna be doing a couple polls and within those polls, there are multiple questions. So be sure to scroll down on your screen as you look at the polls to make sure you don't miss any of the questions that are being asked. So without further ado, I get to introduce the, uh, Dr. P.K. Kanan. P.K., take it away. Thank you very much, Chris. Of course. Thanks, everybody. And, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Um, what I want to uh, discuss very uh, briefly today is to uh, look at what has happened to marketing as a function, uh, how has consumer behavior changed, uh, in this pandemic and what are the prognosis for companies going forward. And so, uh, you know, uh, when it started and I had some researchers uh, with whom I work with, some students, ex-students, and we started working on some data sets from companies uh, who were, uh, you know, experiencing the pandemic effects. And uh, it, it came up with very some interesting stories about what was going on. And I want to share some of that, some insights uh, as we discuss uh, the seminar. Uh, please feel free to uh, send your questions to Chris uh, as soon as you have them so that you will have that when we take breaks. All right, so what we're gonna focus on today is uh, three things. Uh, we will first focus on uh, how is the consumer behavior impacted? And it's probably something that you already know because you're experiencing, experiencing it, you are a consumer, uh, but we will look at uh, how channel migration has taken place and taking place uh, what are the changes in habits of consumers and how their product and service preferences are changing. So having established that, we'll try to look at what does it mean for the firms? What does it mean for the firms if they have to acquire customers uh, and retain customers uh, during this pandemic? And what does it mean for how they're going to spend their marketing budget? Uh, how are they going to reallocate the marketing budget on brand marketing versus performance marketing? So we'll see some issues involved with that. And finally, uh, we'll look at what are the long-term implications. 
So given the pandemic, how should firms respond or how should they gear themselves up, uh, plan things for the future? And so we will look at the longer term, uh, looking at developments in analytics as well as in digital, multi-channel marketing, omni-channel marketing, and also some of the other issues that people really don't talk about in the context of marketing, but I want to just bring it up because there are some interesting insights that we found as we talk to people. All right, so the first poll is going to be uh, given to you right now, and Chris, you can go ahead with the uh, first poll. Uh, please respond to these questions so that we get an idea as to you know, how participants feel about these different uh, questions. And please just remember to scroll down. There are seven questions. Okay. So if you, if you look at the poll answers, here are the poll answers. Um, and uh, you, you can see here, most people are still working from home. Uh, haven't had time to travel, no reunions with friends and family in the last uh, six months. Uh, I'm forced to shop online for things that rather shop offline, 81%. And I have not touched my airline or hotel app in the last three months, 61%. I have put off several purchase plans due to the pandemic. And I have discovered a new talent I had skills for in the last six months. So about 47% or about half of you have uh, indicated that you found something new. Now, the reason that I'm asking is uh, if you think about these questions and what you have answered, uh, there are um, you know, ways in which your own uh, behavior has uh, gone a dramatic change. And so we will, we will take, uh, you know, take that into account and uh, look at so what is going to happen with consumers uh, with the changes that you have experienced. So if you look at um, impact on your customer journey, you now typically people talk about customer journey where uh, consumers go through uh, different touch points uh, in making purchases, making purchase decisions. So they go through this awareness stage and consider and purchase. And then there's a post-purchase stage, word of mouth. And if you look at the environment within which consumers are, uh, you know, experiencing, uh, you know, you have online, you have ubiquitous connectivity, which allows you to connect to TV and uh, mobile and all kinds of connections, the Zoom, uh, and e-commerce platforms, social media platforms, search marketing. And when it comes to offline marketing and intermediaries, and this is where the uh, important changes that have occurred, you can see here this offline market intermediaries, that option that consumers really had before have dis has disappeared, right? With the pandemic, uh, a lot of people haven't been able to access those markets. And so as a result of that, there is a fundamental change in how people are making decisions with respect to the trade-offs that they are doing across channels. So if you look at uh, the channel trade-offs, there are certain uh, critical factors that people take into account uh, you know, in, in a very implicit way as they are making decisions as to which channel they want to go and operate in. You know, certainly, product price makes a difference. Uh, but what has happened during the pandemic is there are certain factors that have become very critical. So typically when people make a decision between offline or online, you know, they'll take into account the product price and they may say, well, online, the product price is cheaper. I might go there. Search costs may be cheaper there. Uh, but on the other hand, people may say, well, there are certain product categories where I really like the experience of going and uh, interacting and shopping with the item 
And so offline may actually be better. And, uh, and then comes the risk cost. The risk cost here is the economic performance quality risk. But then what has become a very big risk now is the personal risk. And so if you take the personal risk into account, people are saying, well, I want to avoid offline and I want to go online. You know, distribution costs is another one that might generally play a role, but people really don't care about distribution costs now. And market access costs. Offline is not just available to anybody. And if you are in a particular category of demographics, certainly market access cost is going to be very big. You know, uh, senior citizens really don't want to move away from their homes. And uh, offline is off limits for them. And so they have to go to online, even though the experience cost they have of going online and interacting is also very high. But they are overcoming that in trying to access online, even though they may not have the experience. So if you look at the data that's given to us, you know, this is a... PK, may I yeah. interrupt you real quickly? I think we're having that buzzing noise. And I wonder if we might quickly switch the audio. I apologize, but. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I think that's much better. Thank you. Much better? Okay. Yes, thank you. All right, so if you look at this, um, you know, the way that uh, the channel has, you know, people have migrated channels. You can see here in uh, the year, this is the US internet users who have increased or decreased their digital spending since the coronavirus uh, pandemic. This is May 2020. You can see here, uh, Gen Z 18 through 23 have increased by 65%, 63% in the millennial category, Gen Z 60%. Baby boomers, you know, people who typically are the last one to get online, they have increased it by 47%. So you can see here that there is a tremendous uh, change in consumers' behavior as to how they have migrated channels. And what's going to happen is this. You know, you may have a cost of going online, and initially the cost may be really high. But as you experience online more and more, you become much more uh, familiar with it. And so you become a lot more comfortable with that. And certainly, you may actually stick on with that channel more than you would otherwise. And so if you look at the responses that people have given, and this is about channel migration uh, response in UK, and I'm giving you an example of what's happening in UK, but if you can see here, after the pandemic, what are the chances that you're gonna change the way that you shop, right? So you can see here, shop digitally for groceries has increased 26%. And uh, domestic travel has gone down. Uh, international travel has gone down, shop in physical stores has gone down, uh, going to movies, concerts and events gone down, going to the mall has uh, gone down. So you can see here net, there are certain things that you, would, you did not do before, but you're doing it more now. And as you become more comfortable with the online option, your behavior is going to change going forward. Now, the other important thing is the change in customer habits. Um, you know, you, you, for many things, you may actually do a very uh, clear, you know, trade-offs in whether I should buy online or offline, should I buy it here or there. But many items which you typically consume, you really don't even think about it because you are habituated for uh, making these kinds of purchases. I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, when I go to school, I, I usually stop by a Starbucks and I just pick up a coffee and then move on. And, you know, that's my habit, right? I just go and stop and get something and move. Now, once the pandemic hit, um, I really couldn't go out anywhere. And I was out of my comfort zone. I really didn't know what exactly I was going to do. But on the other hand, I got a coupon from Panera Bread, which is very close to my home. And this time, I just took my car, went there and got the stuff and came back. And so my habit actually changed. Now I go there very often. I don't go to Starbucks anymore. And I have a preference now for Panera. And maybe after the pandemic is over, maybe I'll go there more often. So what I'm giving you is examples. And there are examples like that in your own life where you find that because of habits that you have changed, 
your preferences have changed because of the constraints that you have. And certainly what might happen over time is that you may have a liking for new items which you hadn't tried before, and then you may start liking them and they may switch to those uh, new brands. And so if you look at the impact on the different categories, consumers have reduced their spending in general, focusing only on essentials. And then discretionary product sales lag significantly, even for the high income segments. And one interesting thing that I found when we were looking at uh, the data from China was we expected that, uh, you know, beauty products and other discretionary items, the sales would go down. But we, to our surprise, we found that even during the pandemic, beauty products actually went up. And digging in further, what we found was that people were bored at home and they wanted some outlet. And, and so beauty products was something that they purchased and they started just using it even when they were not going out. And just as a, a you know, substitute for the things that they would do otherwise. And so you can see here, that you really cannot say, well, certain products are going to be affected this way or that way because consumers' behavior are changing in fundamental ways, which you really, and there are lots of substitutes going on with respect to the different things that you would do. For example, um, you know, you're staying home and, uh, you know, you want to beautify your home, you want to remodel your home. Home Depot has been doing really well because people have time on their hands and they don't have other things to do. They can't go golfing, they can't go outside, they can't travel, and they spend a lot of time at home. And so they think about remodeling and Home Depot has really benefited from that. So it's important to see how fundamentally consumers behavior is changing because of all these constraints. And it kind of gives you an idea that, you know, things are not going to be the same going forward. And the other important thing is, like you pointed out, you have put off a lot of purchases that you're going to do there's a pent up demand for non-essentials, which uh, you know, is going to realize as the pandemic really uh, goes down. Now, here is an example of how you know, people have responded. 75% of consumers have tried a new shopping behavior and most intend to continue behind the, uh, beyond the crisis, All right? A new shopping method, different brand, a different retailer store or website, private label, store brand, new digital shopping method using mobile apps and so on. And they intend to continue beyond the pandemic. So basically what it is, is a shock happened because of the shock, it has fundamentally changed consumers behavior and that needs to be taken into account as we go forward. So at this point, I'll take the first set of questions. Thank you, PK. Um, let's see, we have one from our um, participants and there was a slide that you had about two or three back the channel, chi channel, excuse me, channel mm -hmm. migration slide. And um, the question from Ajay was, have all segments of the economy increased digital spending? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, digital spending has gone up like we showed in the demographic groups, right? In the demographic groups, you have, um, you know, baby boomers who are typically high income and they have moved into digital and they are spending more on digital channels. And so digital has certainly seen an increase uh, across the board, uh, across all uh, customer segments, right? And, uh, but it is not a substitute. So, you know, offline sales might have gone down, but not all the offline sale decrease has gone to online, which means if the offline sales goes down by 50%, out of the 50%, some portion has gone to online and the rest of it is either lost or is it a pent up demand which may realize at a later point in time. Thank you. Um, you've been talking a little bit about the individual consumer perspective. Right. What would you, what are your feelings around business consumers and have their behaviors been impacted? That's a great question. Um, the reason that I uh, focused on consu uh, consumer segment is uh, understanding how, you know, it's easy for us to understand how consumers have been affected. Now, if you were to think about the business uh, consumers, uh, the business consumers are basically uh, people who are, you know, the firms who are interacting with individual consumers. And to the extent that the individual consumers are affected, uh, the upstream, the suppliers to the individual customers have also been affected. And so 
you know, it's a chain reaction. So the business consumers essentially have lost business, right? So think about um, if you are a supplier to Marriott. So let's say you supply things to Marriott. Marriott has lost all its consumer base. I mean, nobody is staying in the hotels anymore. So if you are a, a company which is depending on Marriott as your customer, your, uh, you know, your actually market has diminished tremendously. So you now have to look around and see, you know, which other customers I can go and, you know, try to get my sales up. And so it is exactly what is going on with the companies. The companies which are selling to the individual consumers are getting affected themselves and they are customers to the upstream um, you know, firms and the upstream firms are also getting the brunt of the uh, impact. Very good. I'm gonna, let's just do one more question. There are two participants who asked very similar questions around okay. the comment that you made about habits. Um, uh -huh. And really the question surrounds, will these habits stick or will they revert back um, after this pandemic is, is contained a bit more and will folks revert back to previous behaviors? What are your thoughts? Yeah, the habits, that's an interesting question about the habits. Now you have, you know, the, the, the reason uh, that these habits have changed is because of the constraints that have happened. The constraint gets removed. Maybe if you are very, let's say, for example, I gave you the Starbucks example. If I'm a real uh, loyal customer of Starbucks, I may probably go back to Starbucks because my old routine has taken hold and the, in the old routine, Starbucks plays a big role and I might go back. On the other hand, if my preference for this new brand that I'm trying out has really gone up, I like it so much, then I'm going to change my habit in such a way that I may incorporate this new experience that I've had. Right. And the, the interesting thing, you know, the one thing that you will find is I ask you this question, um, you know, have you taken up a new, um, you know, uh, you know, like a hobby or a new skill that you had and 50% of you said yes. And what does that say about us, which means we are looking for substitutes and and once you like it. Right. And it may you may continue with it. So I would say it really depends on different situations, you know, uh, and, and all the polls seem to suggest that there is going to be some uh, level of uh, change that is going to stick, right? And, uh, and, and you know, it depends on different categories and how people's uh, habits are changing. And certainly things have, you know, changed and the firms have to take that into account. Thank you. If you'd like to continue, we can take another break okay. later. Okay. All right, great. Okay, so I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna to look to see what happens um, to firms, right? So what is the implication of all this on the firms? So let's look at the profitability of a firm. The profitability of a firm, I, I typically tend to use customer lifetime value um, you know, idea in order to understand how firms are affected. So what I have here is a simple equation, all right? Customer lifetime value is equal to margin per visit or purchase times the frequency of visit times this FR is a multiple, which is depending on the retention rate. So if you are highly loyal, then this FR term is a multiple, which is closer to four or five. But if you're not very loyal, it's probably usually like 1.5 or something like that. So uh, the least value of that is one, right? And then you subtract off the acquisition cost. So typically, when you look at profitability of customers, you essentially say it's margin times a margin multiple minus the acquisition cost. Now, what has happened as a result of all this pandemic, right? So if you think about a store, um, you know, you may not visit the store very often. So the frequency has gone down. Uh, maybe your margin per visit uh, maybe goes up or goes down or remains the same. It's not very well known, but the frequency has gone down. And what is going to happen to your retention rate? If um, you know, people really uh, change their behavior and go to a new brand, like for me going away from Starbucks, I'm not visiting them often and maybe I'm not loyal anymore. And that, in, that impact is going to be pretty hard because that multiple actually comes down in value, right? So the repurchase rate frequency is negatively impacted, uh, especially for non-essentials. And consumers changing habits and preferences will negatively affect the FR term, which is the multiple term and the multiple value goes down. And so what happens is the customer lifetime value of 
the customers that a company has because of this changing habits and because of changing environment, uh, they're going to have a problem in, in getting profitability, right? And for example, many companies have invested a lot of money to assiduously, uh, you know, create loyalty among their customers. And now what they are finding is that they are the risk of losing this loyalty premium. Now, when I call, when I say loyalty premium, I'm, I'm talking about this multiple that you have. And because the market is in a state of flux, the equilibrium has been destroyed. And so many firms, especially those who are offline, uh, the stores and everywhere else where you cannot go there anymore, restaurants, and if you think about those kinds of things, you know, they have really lost all this loyalty premium and you really don't know uh, whether they will be profitable at any point because they have lost so many customers. Now, what about acquisition of new customers? Now, uh, you know, if you think about it, there are gonna be some winners and losers. Right? Changing customer habits make some of them, especially online firms, uh, big winners because they have the option of providing you with uh, services which the off online, offline firms really cannot do. Now, if you look at the direct-to-consumer firms, Blue Apron, Wayfair, Peloton, Noom. So these are all companies which have done excellently well. And the reason for this, of course, is very clear because Blue Apron you know, which gives you, you know, or, you know, you order it online and they send you the food, your home so that you can cook at home. Um, before the pandemic hit, their stock price was $2.16. Within a week after pandemic, their stock price went up to $16, about 800% increase in their value, right? Where does this uh, increase in the value come from? It's because people expect changes in consumers uh, shopping habits, and they're staying home, they're gonna buy food in, they're gonna be delivered. Uh, same thing with Wayfair. Wayfair, people are sitting at home and they can't go out of their uh, homes to check out things. They go online and look at uh, options available and Wayfair has been doing exceedingly well during this. So the direct to consumers have, you know, a very good bond with consumers now because consumers are locked in and they're staying home and they're you know, looking to interact with companies and so they have benefited. And you have these omni-channel firms. Omni-channel firms like Target and Walmart are able to weather the shock better than smaller firms because uh, they have options of you know, things delivered to your home. And Target results came out just recently and they've done exceedingly well. So the challenge is for those customers, uh, for those firms who have lost customers. You know, how are you gonna get these people back, right? And uh, so after the pandemic, will people come back to me? So what do I have to do now so that I uh, you know, set myself up so that I can re reclaim all the customers I have lost? And, and that might be a difficult question because it really depends on the different categories where you're working. Now I'm gonna ask uh, Chris to do the second poll. Thank you, PK. Um, regarding acquisition costs, oh no, I'm sorry, you're doing the poll. Okay, yeah. here we go. Let me see how many questions we've got here. I was ready to do questions. Okay, five questions. Don't forget to scroll down, folks. Great. So we're looking at the answers. Um, cutting budget for about half of you say they have cut budget. Uh, we are spending money on brand marketing but don't know its impact, about half again. Uh, and we are spending um, more now on affecting conversions and sales, uh, about half and half. We are very siloed, yes. Uh, uh, it's better to cut marketing spending in these dire times. And most of you said no, uh, which makes sense. Uh, so uh, let's uh, you know, stop sharing the results now and, and get back. And so 
you know, what I want to show here is that, you know, marketers are mixed in terms of, you know, what they want to do at this point. Uh, it's not very clear whether they should, um, uh, you know, cut the spending or not. So here is a, you know, some data from CMO survey from Duke, Fuqua School. Uh, B2 firm, B2, uh, B2C firm sales and profits are significantly lower and more than 30% of them have said uh, they're cutting marketing spend. Uh, the B2B firms are relatively better compared to the B2C firms. And, and what companies are generally doing is they are redeploying uh, budget across marketing instruments, uh, sending things. Uh, so there are you know, important things to understand. There are pockets of opportunities where advertising elasticities are very high. Now, for example, the DTC brands that I talked about previously, they saw a 14% increase in TV ad impressions despite spending 3% less in TV ad in the first half of uh, 2020. So what does that mean? That means even though they spent less, they got more impressions. So the advertising elasticity for TV has increased. And, and that is pretty straightforward to understand because you're, you know, people are captive at home and they watch more TV. And so the impressions on TV uh, goes up. And so for the same amount that you're spending, you get more in value. And so if you start looking around and look at different instruments and see which elasticity has increased, even though you may spend less, you probably can get better results for that. And, and focusing on those new customers who are willing to switch, uh, you know, people who have been uh, taken away from their habits and they don't know what to do. And now they are presented with new options. And so, you know, intercepting them and providing them some options, which will allow them to substitute what they were doing before with new options allows them to really, uh, you know, so there, there again, elasticities are going to be very high. And now let's look at brand performance, uh, you know, brand versus performance marketing. And here is your purchase funnel that you usually have. And if you look at this purchase funnel, you have brand advertising, uh, which creates the awareness part. And then you have performance advertising, which is focusing on more of the conversion part. And then you have retention and advocacy. And so what has been happening here, let's take an example of uh, Marriott. Marriott, um, you know, what will they do with their marketing spend? Uh, there is nothing to do with the performance advertising. People are not traveling. So you have to move some of those things to brand advertising because the pent up demand is gonna come back up. And so you wanna be in people's consideration set and so when uh, the time comes, people will go. What happens to automobiles? Uh, people have put off purchases in, in the month of May, in the month of March, people had put off purchases and the purchases were really down, but uh, the, you know, the performance is back up in June. Uh, they had a, a very good month of automobile sales because the pent up demand came up. And so cutting on brand awareness and brand advertising is a bad idea during this pandemic. Now, Cutting on performance uh, advertising may be okay, depending on whether you have a point of a purchases open or not. If it's not open and you're not selling anything, you probably don't have to spend there. But brand advertising is something that you just need to keep continuing on. And, and in, in terms of brand building, building loyalty, right? You know, how do you build loyalty? So uh, this is a survey that was done by Merkel. And what they are finding is you try to, uh, you know, use different marketing technologies or features um, to improve uh, brand loyalty. And, and there have been some good examples from China where companies uh, like Best Seller, uh, they had offline stores. And of course, during pandemic, everything got shut. Uh, and Best Seller went online on WeChat and, and WeChat, that now they have a mini shop option, right? Social commerce. So they set up a mini shop in WeChat, did a lot of word of mouth marketing and, and, and set up, uh, you, know, uh, you know, told uh, all the employees to advertise it to their friends and family and so on. And then they, you know, built up a very good channel to reach customers, even though their regular channel of offline stores were closed. And so you got to look for uh, quick ways in which you can reach the market. Uh, becoming more consumer centric in marketing message and developing new transaction fulfillment capabilities because you really don't want uh, customers cut off from your brand. And now I'm going to stop and ask and uh, feel some other questions. Thank you. Um, you were discussing brand loyalty here, um, uh, but is there an overall brand strategy that a firm should, should be employing during this pandemic? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, great, that's a great point. And if you were to look at it, uh, look from the branding viewpoint, 
you know, you, you really need to know uh, how your brand is doing during this time. So you need to understand consumer sentiment, uh, you know, how agile you are in trying to, um, you know, make sure that whatever perceptions that people have, uh, you know, you, you're working on it, uh, you know, immediately. Uh, and, and then also creatives, the creative part, uh, people tend to, you know, when you, when you become much more numbers focused, you forget about the creatives, but creative is a very important element in building your brand. And again, uh, during this time, you know, with all these uh, upheavals going on in our country, in the US especially, uh, you know, it, uh, remaining sincere and, and, you know, so that people will trust you, right? The trust element is so important. And that's why brand advertising is something that is absolutely, because once the pandemic goes, people have to come back to you. And if they trust you, they will come back, right? They trust you enough, they will come back. And if the trust is not there, you know, they may not even come back. So think about, uh, you know, many of the brands, strong brands that are doing really well now because of the you know, the trust that people have. When people have the trust, the risk cost that we talked about, you know, the risk cost that you, uh, you know, talk about here, that really goes down. So brand marketing is very important because you want to build yourself, insure yourself against the risk cost so that people will transact business with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question around uh, from a, a participant around small and medium sized businesses. Uh, if there if there happen to be extra dollars or there was an infusion of some resources, uh, you know where might a small medium business particularly focus, um, especially if they have a physical presence that had to, to be shuttered or had to be contained from a physical distancing perspective? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? That's a good question. Um, now the question is, if your physical presence is, uh, has been shut, is there a way that you can reach your market still using technology? Um, so, you know, really, you know, coming up with uh, online ways of uh, interacting with uh, companies. So social marketing that I talked about in the case of, uh, in, in the Chinese case, it's a good example. I mean, people really were quick on it. So you will have to look for quick new channels that you can use in order to touch uh, the customers. And it could be uh, through social media. Uh, you can do a lot of, uh, and if you have a delivery that has been set up, uh, you know, it really depends on how you're going to do the last a bit of, uh, you know, the last mile delivery, how are you going to enable that to happen or whether they can come to your website and, and start interacting with you so that they can order directly from website. So I think for the small and medium firms, uh, it is a challenge, but they have to look for partners. If they can come up with partnerships where they'll be able to establish a presence online or have, have another channel presence, in order to substitute for the physical uh, channel that they have lost, that will be the key. Otherwise, uh, you know, they will have a lasting impact on their bottom line. Thank you, PK. I think we only have about seven minutes left, so I'm gonna keep okay, you up. Okay, let me wrap it up. Thank you. So what's gonna happen here, um, strategies for the long term, right? The strategies for the long term, uh, you know, those companies which were in the omni-channel environment really benefited, right? If you, if you look at the latest, uh, you know, report, big box stores, they were worried about Amazon and they started having omni-channel options, delivery, online options, and so on. And so when the corona happened, uh, they were already ready, right? They, had, they were ready because of competition, but then the corona happened and they were not, you know, they were not affected as much as the other ones. Right. So the question now becomes, how do you define your customer journey? How do you design it so that you want customers to go through a specific kind of uh, journey uh, that allows them to touch you at all points and so that you will be able to effect some conversions. And uh, if you look at, um, you know, the retail stores, and this is, a, again, the same article which talks about, uh, you know, how retail stores have been affected, virtual uh, you know, the, the Kohl's, Victoria's Secret, Gap, JCPenney, Macy's, all the retail stores have been affected. So going forward, you know, you got to really have online presence and have virtual reality solutions. So technology is the one that you have to invest starting right now so that you'll be ready uh, for the post-pandemic world. And, and that's where people are, where the market is heading, right? And uh, you have to focus on analytics, uh, you know, I mean, People are saying that all advertising and digital will be digital driven by machine learning and AI in the next five years. Uh, you can do rapid test and learn. 
Uh, and the interesting thing that has happened because of pandemic is people's behavior has changed so much that the past data that you have is no longer very useful. Uh, the Home Depot uh, CEO was saying, uh, you know, they, they have seen uh, so much demand that they can't use any of the past metrics in order to say what will be the future demand because all of them have gone out of the window, right? Uh, so I think uh, you have to now learn quickly based on the data that you get. Uh, and a lot of historical data is not something that you can rely on very much. So technology has to help you. AI and uh, machine learning has to help you learn things fast right, and in a shorter cycle based on available data so that you can understand consumers' preferences. And of course, designing creatives and content personalization uh, will be very important. Personalized content and creatives uh, to uh, you know, reach customers will also be very crucial. And um, you know, the last thing that I wanna point out uh, before we close is focusing on the human side, right? Uh, in the CMO survey that was done, 80% of the firms responded to observing greater acknowledgement of companies' attempt to do good, right? So uh, consumers are taking, uh, you know, you know they are, the cognit uh, they are cognitive of the fact that you are doing good, right? They, are, they are recognize the, uh, the fact that doing good by companies is something that they take into account. So marketers cannot just do lip service to doing good, right? And there are three areas where uh, things have to really change. Uh, one, one is employee welfare. Right. And, and, you know, if you see the recent article in Wall Street Journal, um, you know, COVID-19 is dividing the American worker uh, in the K-shaped uh, way. That is, there are professionals who are moving up and then there are non-professionals uh, they are going down. And so this is not a good uh, situation for any company. Uh, if you think about people who are, uh, you know, people, they are some, sometimes called pajama workers, you know, people sitting at home and they can still do their work without any problem and get a paycheck versus people who have to be at the warehouse uh, fulfilling orders. Uh, you know, their, uh, you know, welfare is going down. And so the question is, uh, how are marketers going to, how are the firms going to treat their employees? And that is going to be taken into account by customers going forward. Local community building, social value creation, all these things are going to be uh, highly salient when customers make the decision and for your brand building for for consumers to trust you you have to be sincere on all these different uh, points and the factors that are going to be increasingly uh, important for consumers when they make a decision as to who to go to and I think this is something that uh, you know marketers in addition to technology in addition to uh, looking at personalization AI uh, you know, they really have to, uh, you know, think about how to improve the welfare of their employees, the community around them, and social value creation. You know, there is no easy ROI solutions for this, but this has to be done regardless of whatever the ROI you're going to get. And so I'm going to stop here. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you have any more questions, I'll, I'll take that. Thank you, PK. Let's let's end with one question that has some future um, uh you know, future direction to it, which is from Megan. Um, do you have any recommendations for resources to learn more about the intentional building of strategy and aligning um, the metrics that you have shown and the data and the insights to yeah. reality? Any, any a short list that you could provide here today? Yeah, so I, I think what I would, I mean, what I have shown here is nothing new. I mean, it's all from uh, published sources. Um, you know, there are a few places that I go and uh, look for uh, insights. Uh, you know, I'm on uh, in a McKinsey's uh, uh, listserv. Uh, they send me articles, uh, new thought, thought pieces. Uh, I go to eMarketer all the time, uh, you know, understand what is going on in the digital area. So you can actually become, uh, you know, you can sign up for their newsletter. Uh, you know, so what really it does is it gives you data, a lot of data, which you know, you may have a mental model and I have a mental model as to how consumers behave and how, uh, you know, things will change, how the risk cost will be affected. But then when I see the data, that tells me uh, how things are moving uh, in different industries. And I'm able to really look at the data and connect the dots and see what will be the, uh, you know, future in this industry. And so I think that is, uh, you know, important. And I think, you, you know, as a marketer, you have to be a, uh, you know, uh, 
student of consumer behavior. How are consumers behaving? Uh, you know, how are their, uh, you know, you can look around you, look, look around how people are behaving and that will give you some insight. So what I do is get uh, connected so that I can get the data, uh, the pulse of the market. And then I have mental models and I connect the dots and then try to figure out how things are going to happen in different industries. And I think uh, that would be a good way to uh, go about doing this. Very good. Thank you. I think sociology and psychology play a big role. <laughs> um, well, we can't thank you enough, PK, for your time this morning. And it, it seems like we could probably talk about this topic for hours, right? Um, so thank you. Any last, any last, any last word at all? Well, I know, I know our, our alums uh, are great and I'm very happy to have alums here. And what I tell alums is this, that, you know, um, you really have to uh, make sure that uh, you are agile in whatever you're doing. So think about uh, plan ahead, uh, you know, keep your eyes and ears open. Uh, don't get into your groove and just keep working in your own, uh, you know, shell. I think you need to keep talking to people, network. Uh, so that you understand where the whole economy is going, how the industry is going. And I think from a career viewpoint, that is an important thing to do uh, on a regular basis. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone, we appreciate your attendance today. We will be um, posting this on the website. We'll also send you an email with the uh, link to it. So you'll have that at the ready to share with colleagues and friends. We look forward to hosting more of these live webinars. So please check back in the future and we'll be sharing on social media as we have in the, in the past uh, months. Um, we hope that you look for more opportunities with the Smith School at large and with executive education. And we thank you from both executive education teams and the alumni relations team for joining us today. Please stay safe and go Terps. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>